Welcome to session 11 of uh, electronic structure theory. In this sen session, I'll be talking about density functional theory, which is a qualitatively different methodology than CI, MCSCF, MPN, and couple cluster, because it doesn't even have the concept of wave function in it. Density functional theory is a relatively modern, uh, recent theory that people have developed that allows one to express the properties of an atom or molecule, not in terms of wave functions, but in terms of the electron density itself, which is a very much simpler object than, than the wave function. Now, the problem is that it's a fairly new theory, so it's not yet uh, totally uh, worked out, and all the approximations and best ways of solving it aren't yet totally developed. So it's undergoing rapid and dynamical growth, and probably there are some still errors and some uh, improvements that are going to be made. But I want, with this uh, session's discussion, to just introduce you to the concepts of electronic of uh, density functional theory, to show you some of its strengths and weaknesses, to give you some idea of where it comes from and what it's based upon, and to sort of give you also some idea of where it probably is going to be going. So that's what chapter uh, session 11 will be about, density functional theory. Welcome to session 11 of electronic structure theory. I start out that way every time. Okay, so this, this session is about density functional theory, which is a very popular uh, subject these days in electronic structure, structure methodology. And I just, let me, I just want to set the stage here a little bit about what's the big deal about it and why is it so attractive. The main thing is, as we'll see, it's fast. That is the scaling of density functional theory with basis set size and number of electrons in your molecule scales like Hartree-Fock or self-consistent field theory as n to the cubed or basis set size cubed. And it doesn't need wave functions. And wave functions are sort of complicated because they have all this permutational symmetry uh, and they depend upon the coordinates of all n electrons. And density functional theory ex is expressed in something called the electron density, which is a function of only three coordinates, r, theta, and phi. So just to set the stage a little bit, let me express some uh, background material here. Here I've written in wave function language something that we're familiar with. We calculate an energy as the integral of psi star h psi. And in that expression, we got this psi function, which is a function, like I said, of 3n coordinates, the spatial coordinates of all n electrons. So if you have a, a DNA molecule with uh, you know, 40,000 electrons, this is a function of 120,000 spatial coordinates. Uh, when we calculate the expectation value of, of this energy, we know that there's two kinds of terms in our Hamiltonian. There's what we call the one electron additive uh, terms like the kinetic energy T and the electron nuclear attraction energy, this thing I call VEN. And we also know there's terms like the E squared over R12 terms, you know, E squared over R12, E squared over R13, E squared over R23, and so forth. And one thing people noticed and knew about for a long time is that you can re-express this uh, expectation value of the, of the total energy as n times an integral that only involves the, elect the operator kinetic energy and electron nuclear attraction energy of electron 1, and then n n plus 1 over 2, number of electron pairs, times the integral of the psi and the psi star with 1 over r12. Let me just briefly uh, run you through the derivation of that so you can see what that's about. But the take-home lesson about that, though, is if you accept that you could express the total energy this way, then you can see that, like for example, in this first term there, the integral of psi star times psi integrated over electrons 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, up to n, that could all be carried out. And the only part of this psi star psi construct you need to keep to let this kinetic energy operator and electron nuclear attraction operator act on would be the R1 dependence. And likewise, in the second term, you could integrate out the coordinates of electrons 3 through n, and it would be OK. You, you, know, you, would, you would never need anything except what's called the 1 and 2 electron information. And the way you derive this, just very briefly, <coughs> suppose that uh, Emily wanted to put in the middle of the psi star h psi, she wanted to put, for example, the kinetic energy and nuclear attraction energy uh, for electron 4. Well, she would have in the middle there this T plus V4. So we would have psi star of R1, R2, R3, R4, did it, and she'd have T plus V electron 4 psi of R1, R2, R3, R4, did it, did it, and so forth. Now, <coughs> what I would do is I would say, okay, in that term of Emily's, let's just 
redefine coordinates so that coordinates 4 and coordinates 1 get redefined. That is just, they're dummy variables that get integrated over. So I could re-express Emily's integral as the integral of psi star of r4, r2, r3, r1, did it, did. And then, in the, then the h would involve t1 plus v1, because we've renamed r1 and r4. And then she would have psi of r4, r2, r3, r1, did it, did it, did it. Okay, now, that's just a renumbing dummy variables. Then the next thing I would do is I would say, we know that psi is anti-symmetric. So if I take any two coordinates, for example, if I take r4, r2, r3, r1, do, 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 and I just take the r4 and r3, and I switch them. I'm not changing their names. I'm just switching their location. If I do that in psi, I get a minus 1. If I do the same thing in psi star, I get a minus 1. So I get the same thing back again, and we're back to just psi star of r1, r2, r3, r4, kinetic energy plus nuclear attraction of r1, and then psi of r1, r2, r3, and r4. So the bottom line is you can carry out this derivation proving that this expectation value of a many electron operator really can be reduced to n times just sort of an expectation value of only the kinetic and nuclear attraction energy of electron 1, and then nn plus, sorry, nn minus 1 over 2, the number of electron pairs, and you can do the same kind of derivation with r1 over r13 and 1 over r14. You can replace all those things with dummies and so forth, and they end up being still expressible as 1 over r12. Now, people knew this stuff for a long time, that you could express everything in terms of what is called the one and two-body density matrices. See, the term here, the psi star of R1, R2, R3, and then psi of R1, R2, R3, you can integrate over R3 and R4 up to Rn and have a function that still contains all the R1 and R2 information you need to evaluate, for example, this 1 over R1, 2 integral. So you never really, the point here is, yeah, people knew that you really didn't need wave functions to get energies if instead you could have these density matrices, these things that are called gammas usually. So a long time ago, people actually tried to parametrize, instead of parametrizing wave functions like as a linear combination of Slater determinants like in CI, they said, the heck with wave functions. Let's just make up density matrices that have permutational symmetry in them, that is, if we interchange R1 and R2, it's minus. We interchange R1 prime and R2 prime, we get minus, because the wave functions have anti-symmetry. They tried that, and they made up parametrized density matrices with variational parameters in them, put them into this energy expression, varied the parameters to get an, the lowest energy, and they got energies below the true energy. And you say, whoa, what's wrong there? Well, there's one thing that was wrong in what they were doing. They didn't realize that they couldn't uh, guess these, wave, these uh, density matrices just freely. They had to guess them in a way or construct them in a way or parameterize them in a way that you, one could be assured that a density matrix that you put forth to me actually comes from an underlying wave function that is anti-symmetric in all its variables. And this is something called the n-representability problem of density matrices. You can't just make up out of space uh, arbitrary functions of R1, R2, R1 prime, and R2 prime that have anti-symmetry, they must be guaranteed that they came from some underlying wave function. So you can't escape wave functions, really. So people knew about this in density matrix theory for a long time. But density functional theory is actually a, a stronger step away from wave functions than even that. It says, hell, I don't even know, I don't even need the density matrix, I actually just need something called the density. So density functional theory, which we're about to start talking about now, it says to evaluate the energy and other properties, you don't really need psi, you don't need the density matrices, all you really need is something that is called rho of r, the electron density at point r theta phi. And rho of r is nothing but take psi star, if you knew psi, take psi star, take psi, integrate out the positions of electrons 2, 3, 4, up to n, and you would be left with something that's where is an electron that whose coordinate we're just calling R1. That would just be the definition of electron density at point R1. Okay, now, I, w I just want to make sure that we get a little bit comfortable with this. So density functional theory says, I think we can get everything in terms of just the electron density. No wave functions are needed. <laughs> and I'm going to prove 
something called the Hohenberg Cone Theorem about density functional theory in just a minute, but just I want to proceed a little bit more with this. Does it make sense and what's this, does it feel good to say that, that electron density determines everything? Now what we're going to see in density functional theory is there's a series of equations that are going to be called the Cone-Sham equations that we'll get to that look like this on the top slide. They have a kinetic energy acting on some orbital. So there are going to be orbitals in density functional theory. They're just not wave functions. So kinetic energy acting on orbital. And then we have our nuclear attraction potential acting on orbital. And the way that we will write the Coulombic interaction of the electron that's in that orbital phi with the other electrons in the molecule is we'll write it as E squared over R minus R prime, the distance of electron R prime to your electron R, of rho of R prime, that's the electron density. So here's where the density is going to come into the equations. Rho of R prime tells what's the electron density, in a sense, of the other electrons at point R prime, and you are at point R. And so there's that. that now I think if you're really clever and sort of think about things, you might wait to say, wait a minute. If I'm at point R, and this has the total electron density at all points R prime, what about this double counting thing that arose in hartree fock theory where we had to be careful not to count my interaction with myself? Okay, be, You should be careful because this is one of the problems that's going to arise when we try to do density functional theory in a computationally practical manner, that this way of expressing the Coulombic interaction of me, the electron in phi, with the other electrons in the molecule, expressing the Coulombic interaction in that way has this danger because it does count my interaction with myself, sort of, which is stupid. And then finally, there's going to be another potential, U of R, that's going to officially contain the terms that have to do with exchange and electron correlation. So density functional theory, people like it because it has a hartree fock like working set of equations, orbital level things, Hartree Fock or Fock like operator acting on phi gives epsilon phi. Its potential is a little more complicated than in Hartree Fock. There's no, in Hartree Fock, which I've written on the second equation here, we had kinetic energy, nuclear attraction, and we have these Coulomb minus exchange integrals that are expressed in terms of the, the orbitals themselves. In density functional theory, it looks very similar, except we got this U that I've never told you yet what it is. It, it's called the exchange correlation potential, and it's the heart of density functional theory. So in density functional theory, the first thing I'd like you to sort of see is that in the hartree fock theory expresses the Coulomb interaction as a sum over occupied orbitals of a Coulomb operator sub j, you know, sum over j, j sub j. In density functional theory, that Coulomb interaction of the other electrons with u gets expressed as this e squared times the integral of rho of r prime, 1 over r minus r prime. So in hartree fock theory, you could make this summation over j of the Coulomb operator sub j equal that rho thing of density functional theory if you include the term j equals i. That is, let the integral j sub j include the index i, which is the orbital you're acting on. But then you've got to be real careful because you want to make sure that in the exchange part, the term that has k sub i, that is when j equals i there, is also included to allow for cancellation of this so-called self-interaction that shouldn't be there. Now here's the problem with density functional theory. It insists on expressing the Coulomb inter interaction in this way of rho, in terms of rho, that includes the total electron density. But then the problem is when they make up potentials for this u of r, they can't yet construct potentials that have precisely the right amount of exchange to subtract out that self-interaction that's in this row. So hartree fock theory does subtract it properly. The density functional theory fails just because human beings who make up these u's so far haven't got good ways to make the u perfectly remove the wrong self-interaction that's in this incorrect way of writing the total Coulomb energy. And so I'm just saying this now. We'll see this again a little bit later. But I'm just trying to divulge some of the dirty laundry of density functional theory ahead of time. OK, so let me just verbalize with you now for in a couple of slides here what's called the Hohenberg Cone Theorem, which is the fundamental underpinnings of density functional theory. It says that the ground state electron density, just total rho of R, describing any electron, any n electron system uniquely determines the potential V in this Hamiltonian I've written here. Now, 
Look at the Hamiltonian. If I had a molecule whose uh, identity I'm not yet telling, that I was hiding from you, and I exposed to you this Hamiltonian, I said, it's a summation over J of the kinetic energy of, op of motion of electron J. And then it, in the last term here, I say, and it has in it, I, I can see I have a little typo here, this E squared over 2, the summation over K should be there because I already summed over J on the outermost summation sign. So this is a sum over electron pairs, 1 over RJK. Well, that doesn't depend anything upon where the nuclei are sitting. These are just electron and electron interactions, and the first term is electrons moving. Where the nuclei are sitting and what their charges are would be in this V. So that's the electron nuclear attraction potential. That's when the Hohenberg cone theorem, that's what it's saying that if I knew the electron density, that electron density will uniquely de determine this Hamiltonian for me because it will tell me how many electrons there are. Now that's that's pretty obvious. If I have the electron density everywhere in space, I should integrate that out over all space, integral of rho of r over integrated over r, and I get the number seven. That tells me there's seven electrons in the system. So the in, rho of r integrated certainly tells you the number of electrons. That tells you in this Hamiltonian that j and k run one to seven. So that's helping you to learn what the Hamiltonian is. But the other problem is how does the electron density tell you what this V is? The V is the nuclear attraction potential. It's information about where are the nuclei. In other words, is that seven just a nitrogen nucleus, and we're talking about a nitrogen atom? Or is instead the seven electrons a um, CH molecule, where we have two nuclei, a six and a one? How do we know? Well, <laughs> I just want to give an expression now of plausibility, but then I'll show you this proof. Uh, we know that rho, the electron density, has these cusps because the wave function has cusps at the nuclei. So in principle, if we knew rho exactly and we could see these sharp cusps, we could see does it have one cusp, in which case it's nitrogen atom, or does it have two cusps, and then we would know it might be CH molecule, but instead it might be... Uh, what would be one fewer than carbon? Uh, what, what is it? Boron. Yeah, boron. It might be BH2 if we see three cusps. So by looking where rho has cusps, and if you look back at our discussion of the cusp con conditions of wave functions, you'll remember, or others go back and look at it, that the strength of the cusp, that is the slope of the wave function at the nucleus, how steep it was, depended on the nuclear charge. So all I'm trying to do here is to rationalize that, in principle, it makes sense that electron density could give you the total number of electrons. You just integrate it and get in the seven. And if you knew it well and you could see its sharpness at the various cusps, you could see how many cusps there were, telling you how many nuclei there were, and from the sharpness of the cusps, you could say the nuclear charges. Once you know that, you would know the Hamiltonian because you would know summation over J, one to seven, kinetic energy, this V would now be known to you. It's where, where the nuclei are sitting and what their charges are. So rho has just determined the Hamiltonian. Now, here's the way that, so that was a plausibility argument. This is sort of the mathematical variational way that people prove the Hohenberg cone theorem. So suppose we had the following. Suppose we knew an electron density rho of r at all points. Well, I just said a moment ago that we could now integrate that rho of r, and I've got an integral sign that's missing there. The integral of rho of r d3r would give n. So now we know how many electrons in our problem. So with the part of the Hamiltonian that's the kinetic energy and the electron-electron interaction energy, we now, repulsions, we, we know how to write that down. So what we're trying to prove now is, is the following, that if I know rho of r, I will be able to say there's only one Hamiltonian that's consistent with that rho of r. So here's how I'm going to prove this. I'm going to prove it by contradiction. Suppose that Diane and Emily have two V of R's, V of R and V prime of R. So Diane's V of R, Emily's V prime of R. And all I mean by that is that the V of R is the nuclear attraction potential. It's, a, it's knowledge of what the nuclear charges are and where they sit. Suppose there are two answers, in other words, that give the same row. So suppose that I have a row. And I assume that there's actually two or more separate V of R's that could give rise to the same electron density, rho of R. 
Now suppose that Diane and Emily have taken each of their Vs. So Diane has taken the kinetic energy, the electron-electron repulsion, and her V of R, and gone and formed her wave function for, the, let's say, the ground electronic state, E0, and she's gotten her exact wave function, psi of R. Suppose Emily has taken her different V prime of R and the kinetic energy, electron-electron repulsion, and her V prime of R, and suppose she's very smart, just like Diane is, and she exactly solved the Schrodinger equation for her V prime of R to get her ground state energy, E0 prime, and her ground state wave function, psi prime. Now, what we're going to try to do now is to prove that can't be. That is, that it's contradictory to assume that there really were two separate uh, V and V primes that could give the same, uh, not the same Hamiltonian, different Hamiltonia, because they have different V and V prime, but the same electron density. So what we do is we say, we're assuming that the wave functions of Diane and Emily's when squared, you know, when it's multiplied by psi star psi, and integrated over coordinates 2 through n, give the same rho of r. Okay, now what we do is the following. We say, suppose that Diane, I think is what it was, <laughs> she knew her ground state energy, it was E0. And her ground state energy was essentially her psi h with her potential in there, psi. But she says to Emily, Emily, I want to borrow your wave function to use as a trial wave function for my Hamiltonian. So Diane goes and forms the integral of psi prime h psi prime. So that is, she uses her Hamiltonian, but she uses Emily's wave function. She knows that that expectation value must be higher than or equal to her energy, E0. Why? Because her E0 was psi h psi, where psi was the correct wave function for her h. Okay, so if we say uh, Diane's E0, therefore, must be less than or equal to Emily's psi star prime, Diane's h, Emily's psi star prime. Emily's the wrong wave function in this case. But Diane's h and Emily's h differ only in their v. So in Diane's, in this expression here for Diane's h, I could replace it by Emily's h prime plus then essentially would just be V of R minus V prime of R. That's just the difference between Diane's H and Emily's H is this V minus V prime. So this expression that says Emily's true energy must be less than or equal to could be written as psi prime H prime psi prime. But wait, that's Emily's E0 prime. So we can say that E0 must be less than or equal to E0 prime plus, now the V minus V prime comes just because that's H minus H prime. The rho comes about because in the integral of the psi prime, psi prime integrated over coordinates 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's what rho is. And we're assuming that Emily's rho and Diane's rho are the same. That's the assumption, that they give the same density. So that's why I don't have to worry about whether I call this rho or rho prime. They're by assumption two wave functions gave the same density. Okay, so we end up with an equation that says that Diane's energy for her ground state, E0, must be less than or equal to Emily's ground state energy plus this integral of rho of R, assumed to be the same for the two wave functions, times this difference in potentials. But then we turn the whole thing around and we go back and we say, let's let Emily be in charge. <laughs> and so we can do a derivation where we take her wave function and her energy plug in Diane's wave function as a trial function for Emily's Hamiltonian, go through the same thing, and we end up proving that E0 prime, that is Emily's ground state energy, must be less than or equal to Diane's plus rho of R times V prime minus V. When we add the two things we've proven, you know, that Diane must be less than Emily in some sense, and that Emily must be less than Diane, the rho thing cancels because it has opposite sign, and we end up proving that E0 plus E0 prime must be less than or equal to E0 plus E0 prime. And the only way that could be the case is if those two things are the same as one another. It can't be unless the two, wave func the two energies were actually equal to one another. So there's a contradiction, in other words. There, there can't be two wave functions that gave exactly the same densities. That was an assumption we used in proving these things that came from different Hamiltonia. So that's, that's the way the Hohenberg-Cohn theorem is proven, that 
So the bottom line is that, in principle, if I have a way, uh, electron density rho of r, there's only one Hamiltonian that is consistent with that rho of r. And one Hamiltonian means one number of electrons, which I can get by just integrating rho of r, but also only one potential, only one set of nuclei and nuclear positions and charges that would give that rho of r. That's, that's the important conclusion of, of density functional theory. Now that was sort of plausible earlier when I talked about if the integral was seven, and if we saw two cusps, we could tell that it was CH maybe. If we saw three cusps, we, we might say it's BH2. But this is sort of the math proof of that. So you say, oh, that's great. So that means in, in quantum mechanics then, we never need wave functions. All we need is electron densities. Okay, that's correct in principle. So all that stuff there was in principle. It doesn't yet say, if I have a row of R, it tells me how to get N. I just integrate it to get the number of electrons. But I don't yet have a unique prescription. I have a plausibility that I went through that the row of R would tell us where the nuclei sit and their nuclear charges, but it's not qu quite correct that that's, that that's uh, it, you know, it's plausible that's the case, but the prescription of exactly how do you get the potential, meaning where are the nuclei and what are their charges, um, out of row of R is not uniquely and clearly defined yet. And secondly, even if I knew where the nuclei sit and what their charges are, it still doesn't yet tell me from rho of R, how can I get E? I mean, how can I get E without going through the Hamiltonian and the wave function and then getting E? Because that's just sort of a circuitous route to nowhere. And the whole theory of density functional theory is there will be a shortcut where we take rho of R, and we never have to get wave functions, we don't have to do all this CI and MCSCF and so forth, we can have a sneakier formula for E equals something in terms of rho. Okay, now in density functional theory, so what I want to do now is just talk a little bit about does it make sense that the total energy might be writable in terms of rho? Well, it does make sense that the Coulomb interaction of you know, electrons with one another, which I've written here as E squared over two, the integral of rho of R prime, rho of R, one over R minus R prime, dr prime dr, that's the way density functional theory does express the Coulomb interaction between the electron density and itself. Now, you, you know, you've got to be a little, um, let's say, concerned here. Hmm, electron interacting with itself, something's going to be bad here because I've got to cancel out, right? Yeah. Density functional theory is aware of that, and it attempts to cancel out this so-called self-interaction, but it insists on writing the Coulombic interaction energy between or among electrons in this form, E squared over R, rho, rho. That's the way it writes Coulomb integral. So you're, you're stuck with that. You're going to have to watch out for any explosions that will occur by making sure the exchange energy corrects for this. Okay, so in our Hamiltonian, we have electron and electron interaction coulombically. And density functional theory is plausible. It can express that energy like this rho rho thing. We also have the electron feels the nuclei. Well, if we know what the V of R is, that is, what the nuclear names are and where they sit, and we know the electron density rho of R, then the integral of rho of r, v of r, integrated over space, would give the potential, the electron nuclear attraction, potential energy of interaction is plausibly expressible in terms of rho. That, that sort of makes sense. But now here's where I'd sort of challenge you. Two things are coming down the pike. One is, how are we going to write the exchange energy to make sure we get rid of this sin we've committed with this rho rho writing of the Coulomb? And secondly, how can the kinetic energy See, we're used to kinetic energy being psi star, then it's got a differential operator in the middle, psi, and if that's, even if we put Emily's kinetic energy for electron one in the middle, you know, minus h bar squared over 2m del squared electron one, and over here we have psi star of electron one, two, three, and over here we have psi of electron one, two, three, and we integrate out electrons two, three, four, five up to n, we still would have something that has a, a electron one here and then the kinetic energy differential operator in the middle, and how, does, how do we get that out so that we can have just psi star psi integrated over everything except electron one, and then let the, the der derivative operator act there? There's just not clear that kinetic energy can be written in terms of, of the density. Okay, now I'm gonna show you that it, so what I'm gonna do now is to run through with you several advances in density functional theory that are aimed at how do we write kinetic energy exchange energy, correlation energy, and so forth in terms of density. 
So here's how people essentially came up with the derivation of how do you express the energy in terms of density. Suppose you think of just electrons in a box. Now, why am I doing this? Because I know that particles in a box, we are saying that we're not going to treat their interactions between, among themselves, so we're treating these as independent electrons in this box. But the reason that's going to be relevant to our derivation is we want to express kinetic energy. So, in other words, if I want a, a formula for kinetic energy equals something as a function of rho, I want to consider a model problem where all I have is kinetic energy. So we have a particle in a box of length L. And you know the formula for particle in a box is the energy levels are n squared h squared over or the two is it eight two ml squared? I think it's two that's right, two ml squared. So here is nx squared and ny squared and nz squared, three dimensional particle in a box. Now, there, well, there's a little bit of a derivation I have to do here that re, uh, involves density of states. So pretend you think of this nx, ny, and nz axes as just integer axes labeling the quantum numbers, nx, ny, and nz. The point is that every little volume element of volume one in this nx, ny, and nz space contains one quantum state, because a quantum state is labelable by nx equal one or two or three or four, ny equal one, two, three. So what we want to do is to figure out a formula for, in a volume in this nx, ny, and nz space, how many quantum states are in there at a certain total energy, and then how many are between E and E plus dE. So for example, suppose I just said, consider this space here that is my body. And if I told you that the volume I'm pointing at here is like an eighth of a cube, or an eighth, an eighth of a sphere, you know, because it's this axis positive, because nx, ny, and nz are only positive. So this is positive, and y is positive, and z is positive. So for positive values of those three integers, that's an eighth of a cube, you know, because half of each axis. So what I've written here basically is just, I've written a formula for volume, one eighth of four thirds pi and r cubed. And r cubed is just the radius in this nx, ny, and nz space. So it's the summation of and x squared plus n squared plus n z squared is r squared. So it's just a shorthand for that's what I'm meaning by r squared. Just, so what I'm trying to say here now is let's consider this, this one third of this um, sphere and draw a radius of length r. That just labels the total length of these three quantum numbers added together. In, in, inside this volume, there would therefore be one quantum state per unit volume times the volume, which would be one eighth of four thirds pi r cubed, where r cubed is essentially nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squared to the three halves. So what I do is I solve for this r squared by that r squared is 2ml squared e over h squared, that first expression I solve for r squared. I plug that cubed into this formula for phi, and I get the 4 thirds pi times 1 eighth gives me this pi over 6. Then I get the uh, 8ml squared e over h squared to the 3 halves. That's essentially this solving for the r squared in terms of, of e. So that tells me how many quantum states are there between 0 and all the way out to this radius r. But I don't want to know that to do this little derivation. I want to know how many quantum states are out there at a distance between r and r plus dr, or e and e plus dE. So what I do basically is I take the derivative, because what I'm doing is I have this orange, an eighth of an orange, and I've got the volume of the total eighth of an orange. I want to know the volume on the orange peel of the thickness dE. So I take d phi dE, and that gives me the so-called density of states, how many states are out there between E and E plus dE. So that's this g of E. So I just take the derivative of this phi with respect to E, and I get this 3 halves coming down, so bottom line is this pi over 6 becomes pi over 4. There's the 8ml squared over h squared of the 3 halves, and then e to the 1 half. So this is my formula for how many quantum states there are between a total energy e and e plus dE. We're almost there. Then if I say, OK, let's take these states, and let's fill them up 2 for each orbital. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going to calculate both the number of electrons and the total energy. So this first integral says E0, the energy of my ground state where I filled the electrons two at a time, 
between, so I have 2 times the integral of g of e, that's the number of states per unit energy, times e, dE, because I'm calculating the average value or the, the, the value of the energy. Um, now, where you say, how do I, where do I integrate this from? Well, I integrate it up to a certain total energy called the Fermi energy. This is just EF. It means the total, once all the electrons run out, I call the highest level occupied EF. That's just the notation of this field. It's called the Fermi energy. It's like in metals. You call it the Fermi level of a metal where the electrons are occupied up to the HOMO and then the LUMO is empty. So that would be an expression. I just take that G of E, I plug it in there, and I can get an expression for the total energy in terms of the Fermi energy. If I take instead, and I say I want twice the integral of G of E dE without an E in there, this is just saying how many electrons there are, because there's two per level, and I'm adding up all the levels up to the Fermi level. So I would have number of electrons equals blah, blah, blah on the right-hand side, E Fermi to the 3 halves. And now what I can do, watch this logic now. The last equation there, I can take and solve for E Fermi in terms of N. So E Fermi is something I can express in terms of the number of electrons. I can take that then, go back to this formula for E0, you know, the total energy equals E Fermi to the 5 halves. I can solve the last equation for E Fermi in terms of N, plug that expression back here for, into the E Fermi to the 5 halves to get the total energy in terms of N. So I do that. I get total energy equals, and I do all that work, and it ends up having N over L cubed to the 5 thirds. Then you look at that and say, wait a minute. N over L cubed is the electron density, number of electrons per unit volume. So this is the way people sort of came up with the simplest starting point expression that the kinetic energy, which is all you have in particle in a box, the kinetic energy can be written as all these constants out here in the front times rho to the 5 thirds. See, that's rho is n over L cubed. So this is the way that people originally, it's called Thomas Fermi theory, when you express the kinetic energy as all these constants like I have in this middle equation. Now, what they do is they say, wait a minute, that derivation was for the electrons in a box that's uniform. This molecule of mine that's uh, CH or BH2, it doesn't have a uniform electron density in it. So what they do is they use this particle in a box derivation just to rationalize that, well, maybe this is the correct way to express the kinetic energy for each little volume element in my molecule. So what I do is I say, for the molecule, I will take this 3H squared over 10M, blah, 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 all these constants. And at every little volume element in space, I will take the integral of rho to the 5 thirds. See, that comes from this N over L cubed to the 5 thirds rho to the 5 thirds, and I will integrate over space. In the E0 expression at the top there, this L cubed came for essentially by saying I want it over all the volume of my box. So this E0 in the top expression gets uh, replaced by this so-called local density approximation where we say we'll use a formula like this E0 that'll be all these constants times rho to the 5 thirds. We'll use it point by point by point in space. We'll integrate over all points. And all this constant out in front here, this 3H squared, blah, 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 that's usually called the Fermi constant, C sub F, and its numerical value in atomic, remember, Hartree units is 2.8712. Just when you plug in all the numbers, it turns out to be that. So in Thomas Fermi theory, then, what you do to express the total energy of a molecule in terms of its density is you say, give me the density rho at all points in space. The first thing I do is I compute this of Fermi constant, 2.87, times the integral of rho to the 5 thirds dr integrated over all space. I integrate my density like that, but to the 5 thirds power. That's my kinetic energy. I take <coughs> my nuclei positions. I integrate rho times V of r integrated over all space. That's my nuclear attraction energies of my density to them. And then the Coulomb energy I do like this. You say, wait a minute, where is the exchange energy? Well, Thomas Fermi, when they originally made this up, they said, Maybe we don't have to treat exchange. And they were wrong. These energies are not very good energies. So people come up with fancier things. What do they do? In the fancier uh, theories, what they do is the following. <laughs> they have to include exchange. They have to include what are called gradient corrections. And they have to include electron correlation. So in the Thomas Fermi theory, which I repeated here in the top line, there's no exchange. But Dirac, a long time ago, studied 
the same kind of thing. He, it's called uniform electron gas. It's really particle in a box. Part, electrons in a box, basically, are electrons that are in orbitals that you know, sine n pi x over L. They're analytically knowable orbitals. Their energies are n squared h squared over 8 m L squared. I guess it really was 8. Um, and so because in the particle in a box, you know an analytical expression for the orbitals and the orbital energies, all of the equations about uh, writing down exchange integrals, you know, as an exchange integral, and then writing down second order MP2 energy as Coulomb minus exchange integral divided by orbital energy denominator and summing them up. Those things can be done analytical, analytically for a particle in a box um, model problem, which is what's called uniform electron gas. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, Dirac looked at this particle in a box or uniform electron gas model and derived an analytical expression for the uh, exchange energy in terms of the density. And that's what's written here. Is it's another constant, you know, derived from all these h bars and m's and stuff, but it's, and it's written here, this cx constant is 3 fourths over 3 over pi to the 1 third. It ends up being 0.7386 in atomic units, but it involves an integral over space of rho to the 4 thirds. So we have the kinetic energy as an integral of rho to the 5 thirds. We have um, the electron nuclear attraction integral that says V of R rho to the 1. We have the integral of rho rho, row your boat, as the Coulomb Coulomb interaction. And now we have this exchange thing which involves rho to the 4 thirds. So all these terms involve different kinds of rho, different powers of the electron density. Well, people then found out that even this uh, Dirac exchange corrected Thomas Fermi model wasn't really quite good enough, so they came up with fancier theories. So there's hierarchy, hierarchies of these theories. The next thing people did is to say, well, maybe the electron density is really varying fairly strongly in some regions like near nuclei where it really does vary quickly, where you have these cusps. And instead of just using a, a local uh, expansion where we say, let's take the electron density in this volume element times the formula for its kinetic energy and then take the next volume element times the formula for kinetic energy, Maybe we need to do what are called gradient corrections to these things. That is, build into our formula for the energy things that involve derivative of electron density with respect to distance. So there's a guy named Axel Becker who's up in um, Canada who comes up with different uh, ex improvements on this. So for example, Becker improved on Dirac's exchange formula by saying, let's take the Dirac exchange formula. And he, these, the expression here is not just ad hocly written down. There's actually a derivation he made to get this expression. But all I want to say about it today is, if you look at it, so you have this gamma, which is just a constant. But then you have things that are like x. And this x is rho to the minus four, four thirds times the gradient of rho. So it's something that depends upon the derivative of the electron density in x, y, and z space. So it's, that's why it's called gradient correction. It involves the how fast the electron density is varying. So you can see that that rho appears as rho to the 4 thirds. Rho and its gradient appear as this x variable that's x, hyperbolic uh, sine inverse of x. So there are these gradient corrections. A guy named Weizsacker came up with a gradient correction to the kinetic energy that I showed you earlier, the kinetic energy that Fermi had, this rho to the 5 thirds. Weizsacker has a gradient correction to that and involves del rho squared divided by rho, this last integral here. Now, <laughs> the bottom line is this procedure for coming up with better and better ways of writing the kinetic energy, the Coulomb energy, the exchange energy in terms of electron density is ongoing. It's not done yet. Uh, so people are still trying to cook up better and better improvements to these um, functionals that express these terms in the energy in terms of the density. Now, if you reflect back on this, all the stuff I've been talking about here sort of makes it plausible that if I gave you a density, here's how you would plug it into these formulas to get various energy terms. But then you should still be saying, but how do I get the density, Jack? Do I do an experiment? Well, maybe you do, if you could measure it precisely from some experiment. But no. What, now, here's where we come to what's called cone-sham theory. People up to now, in the, in the discussion I've had here, said, well, this is how we express the energy in terms of the density. And for example, here, this, the last one I've got here is um, there's also how do you express the correlation energy? So people uh, analyze, again, this uniform electron gas thing, particle in a box, analytically correct wave functions and energy and orbital energies. 
and they said, if the electron density in the box is very, very low or very, very high, we can actually carry out analytically the, for example, MP2, MP3, MP4, all the way up to MP infinity uh, perturbative expressions for the, the uh, energy, and people were able to do that. And then they were able to use the analytical form of those expressions of the energy as a function of density for low density and high density and make an interpretative uh, formula that connects those two. And then they carried out some calculations on a whole bunch of atoms and, and attuned the parameters in that interpolation formula to agree with the energies of those atoms. So there's a lot of empiricism in here. And the bottom line is they were able to come up also with an expression for the correlation energy as a function of the electron density. EC is integral of rho of r times some correlation energy functional, and I've written a fairly commonly used one here, this EC of rho, and you can see it has, what's it got in there? It's got this log x over x. x is some rs to the one half, and if you trace back, what is this rs? The key thing is 4 thirds pi rs cubed. That's the volume sort of of something is 1 over rho. So the density, 1 over rho, determines this rs, and that determines this x. So the bottom line is, in, in this expression, the electron density is what's in here, even though it's in there in a very complicated way. It's in there lots of different places. And there's parameters in there, too, that have been fit to a database of energies of atoms where this formula has been used. So people, just, this is about the, um, the end of the discussion of the kinds of functionals. People these days, yes, they carry out calculations given a density. They can calculate kinetic energy. They can carry out Weizsacker uh, gradient corrections to the kinetic energy. They calculate electron nuclear attraction. They calculate Coulomb energies. They calculate exchange uh, inter interactions by Dirac. They correct it with the gradient correction. They calculate the uh, correlation energy using the correlation functional, the last little expression there. So all that can be done given a density. But then how do you get the density? Well, what Cohn and Sham, Walter Cohn, the same guy as Hohenberg Cohn, uh, came up with is they said, we know how to get the density because if we knew all this functional about how the energy depends upon the density, we put forth, and they did this, they put forth an orbital procedure that goes as follows. They said, we're going to define a set of orbitals. They're not Hartree-Fock orbitals. They're Cohn-Sham orbitals, they're called. that will be solutions of kinetic energy. I'm sorry, there's a del squared missing here. Minus h bar squared over 2m. It should be del squared acting on phi plus V, that's the electron nuclear attraction potential, phi, plus the Coulomb potential, the way that density functional theory insists on writing it, acting on phi, plus an exchange correlation potential that they gave a prescription for, acting on phi, equals epsilon phi. And they showed how to obtain this exchange correlation potential by taking the earlier expressions, like I just showed you back here, these horrible expressions here, I can differentiate them with respect to rho, and they said if you use those derivatives of those earlier energies with respect to rho as this u, then you will get an orbital level theory that's consistent with this earlier expression for the density here. So they, what they say is we know how to calculate this u, this exchange correlation potential, in terms of the things we just spent a lot of time talking about. Um, as, just as an example, if, we, if they took the Dirac expression for the exchange uh, contribution to the total energy, which was minus C exchange, integral of rho to the 4 thirds d cubed r, then the contribution of that particular one piece of the energy to this U exchange, to this U sub xc, exchange correlation potential, you just take this thing and essentially differentiate it with respect to rho. It would be minus 4 thirds Cx times rho to the 1 third, just like you know, you're know you taking something to the 4 thirds, you get 4 thirds times that something to the 4 thirds minus 1. So they, they have a prescription for calculating contributions to this exchange correlation potential. But then still, how do you get rho? Well, what they said is if you get an exchange correlation potential and if you're able to solve these cone sham equations for these orbitals phi, then the way you calculate rho is the following. You take and sum over all the occupied orbitals of the number of electrons in the orbital times phi squared. And that gives you the electron density. Now that little innocuous equation looks pretty innocent, but 
what I would do is to stop us for just one moment here and say, what if we go back to that case where we had our ethylene molecule where we wanted to break the bond? And we know in Hartree-Fock theory we need pi squared, two electrons in the pi orbital, but we also need pi star squared configuration to properly break that bond. When people are doing density functional theory, this is something they don't have an answer to yet, what they would do, if you're doing a cone sham equation, you would say, I'm going to take two electrons in the pi orbital. And I'd say to them, well, how do you know that instead you shouldn't switch and put sometimes two electrons in the pi star orbital? And they wouldn't have an answer for that. So multi-configurational based mentality isn't yet in the, into density functional theory. So in other words, this, this is where density functional theory, at least in my opinion, isn't correct because it says in the cone-sham procedure here, there's one set of orbitals, and you're going to occupy them with a certain number of electrons in the orbitals, and those electron occupancy, NJs, are going to be something you tell me ahead of time, and you won't change your mind on it. And I'm saying that you better change your mind as you, cha as you rotate this pi bond, because now the number of electrons in the pi orbitals 2 and then the pi star at 0, but over here you know it's got to be half the time it's 2 here and half the time it's 2 there. How are you going to do that for, in this formula? I don't, that's one of the things I think is weak in density functional theory. So here's how density functional theory proceeds in the cone sham process. You have a molecule, where, and you know where the nuclei are sitting. You put atomic basis functions on those nuclei, just like in regular ab initio theory. You go and solve the cone sham equations. And as you take and express these MOs as a linear combination of coefficients times these basis functions, just like in Hartree-Fock, but they're cone sham orbitals. You calculate a density, rho of r, by taking the summation of nj times phi j squared at point r. Ah, what values do you use for those nj's? I don't know what you'd do for that ethylene case. For water molecule, you'd say two electrons in the lowest five orbitals in the ground state. What if you wanted an excited state? Well, you'd take maybe four electrons, one electron, and one electron. Okay, that would be okay for your excited state, maybe. Then you take that density, and you go into the cone sham equations, which I've repeated here for you again. Where's the density go? Well, it goes right in here in this Coulomb thing, integral of rho, prime, rho of r prime, 1 over r minus r prime. So you use that density here. And in this expression for this exchange correlation potential, there's density all over the place in there. Rho to the 4 thirds, rho to this power, x, which was the gradient of rho over rho. So you use the rho that you currently have everywhere it appears in this u exchange correlation and you'd get this equation that's a cone sham equation. You'd solve for new values of phi and new values of the orbital energies. You'd take those new phi's, calculate a new density by using the summation over j of nj phi j squared, and you'd do a self-consistent procedure like in Hartree-Fock. That's why it scales cheaply like Hartree-Fock does, because it's, you're, you're essentially just getting eigenvalues of a matrix. And you compute a new density you resolve the cone sham equations did, 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 until it converges. Once it's converged, you get a certain density and you have these cone sham orbitals. Then you can go calculate your total energy. And the way most people calculate the total energy these days is they take a sum over all the cone sham orbitals that are occupied, number of electrons in the orbitals. How many are? I don't know what those should be for the case of that ethylene. Uh, they evaluate the kinetic energy usually in this way rather than in the Thomas Fermi way, you know, just the, the integral of phi star kinetic energy phi. They evaluate the electron nuclear attraction potential as the integral of V rho. They evaluate the Coulomb energy as rho rho. And then they evaluate the exchange and correlation energy using the exchange correlation potential they have. Okay, now, what's bad about that? This is the last thing that we'll talk about here. Well, what's good about it is it's cheap. Cone-sham equation solutions are very much like Hartree-Fock. They scale as the basis set size cubed, so it's cheap. People like it. The current functionals, that is, these interpolation between the low-density and high-density electron gas formulas that people have come up with, they seem to be parameterized pretty well. So they, are not, they give good energies. They give good bond lengths, good geometries. So that's good. Uh, a negative would be, in my opinion at least, in variational and perturbation methodologies, you have a procedure where you go to MP3, then you go to MP4. MP4, you go to, so you have a systematic way of, you think, improving things. Variationally, in Hartree-Fock and CI and MCSCF, you throw in more determinants. So your energy is going to go down, down, down. In the density functional theories, you have more 
uh, I, I would say more like a band-aid approach where people are saying, well, we put in a gradient correction. I wonder if we should put in a second derivative gradient correction. Maybe we should fit these parameters to a larger database of atoms to get higher quality numbers to be using for our, the form of, and the, the, uh, quali the quantitative numbers in our density functionals. So I don't, in my opinion, the, the procedure for improving the functionals is not yet there. You know, people are not having a systematic way they can know if we add another term, we'll get better answers. Uh, <coughs> another thing is most current functionals in their exchange and correlation part, this very last term in the total energy, if you look at it, the analytical way that they express the exchange is not guaranteed to perfectly cancel out the self-interaction that was in the, mistakenly in that Coulomb term. That is in that row of R prime, row of R, one over R minus R prime, there's a wrongness in there. And the exchange correlation corrections that they have doesn't perfectly, that is analytically, cancel out that wrongness. So the self-interaction energies are something that plagues um, uh, the density functional theories. Another thing is that most density functional theories don't have built into their energy expression something that if you had two molecules that were weakly interact interacting, that you could show that the energy of interaction between these molecules would vary as one over R to the sixth. There, that is, there's no, in those exchange correlation potential functionals that they're using, there's no term that you can say, ah, oh, there's a term that I can guarantee will give the correct one over R to the sixth dependence on distance between these molecular fragments with the one over R to the sixth being something that's dispersion. You know, that's a van der Waals effect, and that's not yet. People are trying to improve them, but it's not yet in density functional theories. And I would also argue the last two things here is <coughs> when you have a situation where in wave function language you know that you have two electronic configurations, two Slater determinants, pi star squared and pi squared, that must be equally mixed or pretty nearly equally mixed in your wave function, how do you tell that to this procedure that's generating this density that you're using in density functional theory? You have to adjust these nj's, the number of electrons in orbital j. How, and it doesn't tell you how to do that yet. I think people are still working on that too. And then I just find it a little bit difficult to believe that that same functional that people are coming up with for these Coulomb and exchange and correlation and everything, those same final formulas, E as a function of rho, are you telling me that even if I plugged in rho for an excited state or for all possible excited states, that that same functional relationship would spit out an energy that would be just as good for those excited states as it is for the ground state? I don't quite believe that because you've parameterized your expression in the energy functional by using ground state energies of a bunch of atoms that you carried out other calculations on. So there, there's some dirty laundry in there. And that's, I think, all that I wanted to say about density functional theory.